Marimba only tells us that Mar for the for Plato, objectification, i.e., separating the self, the true self from everything else, is about controlling everything else. So the purpose of the objectification is to separate from them, separate from whatever it might be, other people, nature, the environment, and so forth, so that we can control that thing. And then what's what's interesting is that she, she, she compares the uh, Platonic uh, objectification, the European objectification, with the idea of the cosmic self. And this cosmic self idea is the idea that is very prevalent amongst most, probably most other people's philosophies, certainly African philosophy, certainly Native American philosophy. She talks about oceanic philosophy as well. Probably you're looking at a lot of indigenous philosophies anyway. The concept of the self is not a thing that is detached from everything else. Rather, the self is intricately linked and related to and part of everything else. And the cosmic self is thus, you know, you you can't uh, you can't see yourself in this in these indigenous worldviews. You don't see yourself as something that's separate from everything else. Rather, you 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 are everything else, and you interact with everything else. But for Plato and others, that worldview that that cosmic self idea is a, is an idea that leads to weakness because again it's all about power and it's all about control for plato and, and his uh, his successors so for them they would look at say the i don't know the B bagisu people in in uganda or, or the or the, the the arawak or the tainos in in latin america latin america in in that part of the world and they'd say these people are weak because they are controlled by their emotions, they are controlled by nature, they are controlled by the elements, they're controlled by all of these things, because for them, it's all, for Plato, it was all about independence. It's essential that the self is completely detached and completely independent of any other causal influences that come in, that come from, from the cosmos, from within the cosmos. And that's like a, a you know, that's a very, very important, import, important, important, uh, principle, which I think we see in the in in the modern world, don't we? We see that idea that basically, for example, I said it last time. I think that, but if someone's considered to be emotional, then it's like, well, you're you're emotional, you're weak, or whatever. Um, similarly, they look at certain people. Anyway, let me not. We, we, she, she's going to unpack that later on as as well. But this 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 um, cosmic self versus the the abstract detached self is one of the key differences between Plato's view. Uh, of the self, of the human, and the, the the view of the self, the view of this human that we find in many other, if not most other worldviews outside of European influence. So from, from the, this whole dichotomization, there are many, many, ex, many, many facets of it. So Marimba Ani talks about, for example, knowledge versus opinions, i.e. a true, the true self is, the true self knows, really knows, but the uh, the cosmic self, the weaker, low, lower self idea, only has opinions. Similarly, the, the 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 true self thinks, but the 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 untrue self, the the cosmic self, the weak self of these other so-called primitive peoples, although we call we should call ourselves prime peoples, first peoples, original peoples. Uh, we the weird they they say that we perceive we perceive things with our senses, and but the Greeks, Plato was like, no, no, no. Anything that comes, any the senses are just, you know, the senses, you must not, that's not true knowledge. You don't get true knowledge through your senses, interestingly, <laughs> He's, uh, Plato says. So on page 40, on page 40, we read this to explain this point. Again, the genius of Plato. Another characteristic dichotomy, an architect, what? An architectonic one. Oh, sorry, I should have found out what that word means. An architectonic one culminating in the famous cogito ergo sum of Descartes about 12 centuries later is born as mind is separated from body. Mind, body, mind, body. The splits that we have mentioned, knowledge versus opinions, perception versus thinking, mind versus body, etc. The splits that we have mentioned are working out in such a way that they deny and prevent interrelationship. They do this on a cognitive level, i.e. the way that we think, 
a semantic level, the way the language, and through the logic on which they are based. The splits then move to the level of culture, worldview, and belief. And they begin to affect experience because although they may not be accurate, they limit people's ability to experience the universe as an integrated whole. It is the essence of quote unquote traditional medicine that the person be considered as a whole being. Richard King argues that in the African conception, not merely the brain, but the entire body is the human computer. In that sense, we also think with our sense organs, which perhaps helps to explain genius on the basketball court. The whole of us thinks. So when you look at something like IQ, you know, the idea of IQ is a instrumentalization of, of the platonic and Western worldview that basically the important knowledge, the knowledge that's important to have, to, 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 to perceive or whatever, the, the, the important knowledge comes through abstract you know, is abstract knowledge only. That's the important knowledge. Every other knowledge is not important. Whereas, actually, our senses are important. It, it, that's that is is valuable. It is valuable to be able to just to be able to move your body in a certain way. Dance is an expression of what you might call intelligence. Uh, song is an expression of intelligence. Musicality, rhyme, rhythm, and all these kinds of that's those are all manifestations of a, of intelligence. If you have a cosmic perception of the self. But for Plato and the Europeans who follow him and the others who think like him, all of that is denigrated. All of that is just inferior, not really worth even, you know, talking about. So Plato, Plato talked a lot about, all Plato and Socrates, they talked about this. They talked about how humans, you know, one of their big distinctions is, oh, let me read this, page 43 again. Sensations, says Socrates, are given at birth. Not only that, but they are given to animals as well as men and they are natural, all of which functions to devalue the senses and sense perception in the European world view. A very strong theme in European moral and political philosophy is the idea that human beings are superior to other animals and that they must protect that superiority in order to be truly human. And a point I want to make on that is that it's important. There are there are many scholars who have pointed out. Uh, I mean, Frank Wilderson will probably be one, and 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 various other scholars have pointed out that when you look at the the writings of people like Carl Linnaeus, who was a Swedish guy in seventeenth century, and others, this whole thing, this whole thing about div dividing up humans from animals, was a critically important thing because animals were in, were were inferior, humans were superior. However, when you have these hierarchies there's always a bit of a boundary isn't it and black people were the boundary they have, have been positioned as the boundary black people i was looking at a post the other day uh, very very sad very angering um history with regard to otto otta benga who was an african an african man who was a who was a was he twa he was, a, he, was a, he was taken anyway, taken away, kidnapped by these Europeans, taken to America, put into what they they had these human zoos uh, back into the back in the day, up up into the twentieth century. There these human zoos where they would they would basically you know because zoos, I mean zoos is a whole subject matter in itself about how the, the the purpose of zoos in European philosophy, the purpose of zoos in the European world sense worldview in because zoos are all about, okay, here you go, here's, you know, ranking, here you go, this this is the lower species, and that's a higher species, that's a higher species, look at that, that's what the, you know, lower species look like. And they had human zoos, they had people that would, they would put in there, so that, so that these Europeans could look at them and say, wow, look at that, they animalized them, because for them, we, melanated original people, were animalistic for them, and, you know, virtually animals, and that's the whole point of Afro-pessimism, actually, is that black people are viewed as not human and are actually the antithesis of human in in western philosophy so so yeah you know they, ain't, that, ain't that true so so the, the the distinction between humans and animals a big part of that is the fact that the fact quote unquote that uh, animals uh, you know are sense are all about their senses but humans shouldn't be about their senses humans have got something higher than senses and then it and then it goes further down here the senses 
perceptions, what is natural to the human, function only in the world of in the world of appearances, and therefore are below the line that separates adults from children in Platonic thought. Our senses can only tell us how things seem to be. True knowledge, on the other hand, relates to the real world of ideas. We are then above the line and are doing important things. Anyone can look at so this is. Anyone can do what is natural and stumble around in the cave in darkness. Light and dark are too, uh, let me. Just... Yeah, I'll stop there. Uh, so this, this, uh, this, this concept, and think about it, you know, search yourself, search your heart, and you'll probably find that you, I certainly do deep down and deep down, I think of intelligence as being something that no 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 it's not something you're born you're not just born with this thing you, you have to cultivate it you have to work on it you have to really you know do, do all these sorts of things whereas anything that's just a, you know the sensory things like oh i can just i don't know i can run fast i can agile and whatnot so we denigrate that so, oh no that's just you're just given that just like an animal is given that that's nothing to be proud of that's that's not important and further than that not only that that's not not only that that is not important but actually that the 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 ideas are the thing that are real. Everything else is not actually fully real in Platonic thought, and this is this is based on or one of the places where Plato really brought this out was his allegory of the cave, which you probably know about. So this alleg allegory of the cave was Plato's way of expressing his truth about what true truth is, what reality is. He um. He had this allegory of, so you've got some people who are living in a cave and they have no access to the outside world. And all they can see is a wall in the cave. Now, unbeknownst to them, there are some other people in that cave who are shining a light or a torch or whatever. And then they've got some shapes that they are making some silhouettes on the wall. And those people who are looking at the silhouettes, they think that the silhouettes are real. They think that silhouettes are what the reality is. So like, oh, there's a shape there. Okay, that's just the thing. It's a thing. It's just the thing. They don't understand. They don't realize that, no, it's not a thing, really. And I mean, it's it's a derivative thing. It's, it's a thing only in as far as it's a, it's a manifestation of the actual real thing, which is the, the shape itself and so forth. And so for Plato, you know, enlightenment and all that sort of stuff comes by getting out of the cave and experience, you know, seeing the reality of things. And so the senses for Plato, can only ever tell you about those things which are not really real. <laughs> things you could see, those things are not real. The real things are the abstractions. The real things are the abstract ideas. Ideas have true reality. Everything else isn't actually really real. So this, what this made me think of was that, you know, have you heard that saying, I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt is said to have said this saying, which is something like, great people discuss ideas. Uh, average people discuss events. And something like, uh, was it weak people or something? I don't know. Discuss people. And, the you know, I used to, I used to be like, yeah, it's so true. Yeah. Because discussing people is just like, that's just gossip. And it's just not, you know, it's not important. It's better to discuss ideas, abstract ideas. You know, we that's, that's the import behind that sort of saying. But, and it's actually a perfect explanation or a perfect manifestation of this platonic idea about what true reality is, you know. So then Marimba Ani asks, why was it important to... She says on page bottom of 40, page 43, going into page 44, she says, but why was it so important to, de to debase the senses in this way? Why did Plato so persistently and unrelentingly drive home the, def the, the definition and confines of this epistemological mode? It was an epistemology that implied a social, ethical, and even political theory. Plato's epistemology did indeed eventually become the foundation for a form of socialized social organization that would facilitate domination of the many by the few. It helped to create a worldview. The epistemology took on ideological implications in Plato's presentation and his commitment to his assumptions. His dialogues were ammunition for the proselytizers, proselytizers who would follow until the assumptions of his epistemology became the assumptions of a cultural tradition. 
These epistemological assumptions translated into an ideological statement in the civilization that would claim them as tradition. The point being that, uh, and this point comes through over and over again in this chapter, remember Aini is pointing out that don't consider these things to just be abstract waffling on for the sake of waffling on. They had, Plato had a very clear uh, image, a view of a society that he wanted to, to create, the Republic, Plato's Republic is one of his texts. And this Republic was supposed to be a state that was dominated by a few enlightened people who would dominate everybody else. So all of this denigration and so forth is, 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 is in support of that and in support of elitism actually in support of the idea that there are only a few people who should rule over the many. That's what that's all about. All of this is basically all about justifying that uh, that, that approach to human society, bringing it into the political, socio-political realm. It makes me, it helps me to understand why in uh, many, perhaps most, but certainly many African traditional societies prior to colonialism, you did not have a state. You did not have these kind of strict hierarchies of control and even in societies that did have hierarchy such as the such as the Yoruba as we discussed uh, the hierarchies the control the power of the leaders the power of the, those who had the power was very 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 context contextual and very very limited very controlled you know there's no absolutism that you have in you know states in other parts of the world and why is that probably because of our worldview, probably because of our, of our sense of the cosmic self and our complementarity and all, all these kinds of things that it just wouldn't, the idea of a sort of strict hierarchy and a strict hierarchical state would just, would find it very difficult to emerge in our cultural contexts. Whereas in a context in Europe where the ideas of Plato and so forth gradually became more and more and more dominant, it makes of course perfect sense because they're following Plato's blueprint, which is which was all about elite control of the, of everybody else. So that's just a, an important point that comes back over and over again through this chapter. 